Okay, welcome back everybody. So uh, this class is going to be on <clears throat> the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. And when we talk about spinal nerves, we'll be discussing the different plexus that we have in the neck and in the lower back. So I just don't want you to be confused by this first statement. So I wanna make a, a modification right away. It says here, the spinal cord and spinal nerves uh, together with the brain forms the CNS. Now that's not accurate. Um, we're going to be talking about the spinal cord right now. So the spinal cord together with the brain forms the central neural system. So the functions of the spinal cord is that it is involved with many spinal cord reflexes. It's involved in the integration of the summation of inhibitory and excitatory nerve impulses. And that's what we covered in the last lecture when we talked about excitatory postsynaptic potentials or inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. The spinal cord is also the highway for upward and downward travel of sensory and motor information. So remember when we have a cross section of the spinal cord and let's see if I can do this for you. Let's say if I were to draw like an imaginary dotted line here, for simplicity, we would say that this side is dorsal and then this side is anterior, or we can say it's ventral. So we have, remember, dorsal roots coming in this way. And then we have ventral roots coming out this way, which can go to skeletal muscle. Now, the gray matter is everything in here in the letter H. This is all gray. And everything outside of that is considered white matter. It's myelinated. So the highway for upward and downward travel of sensory and motor information is taking place in the white matter. We have sensory tracts and motor tracts that are all throughout this region, okay? We're gonna go through them shortly. So the spinal cord has uh, several layers that protect it. Some are soft tissue and some are hard tissue. Uh, bone is obviously hard tissue. So we have 24 freely movable vertebrae that protect the spinal cord. But keep in mind, the spinal cord does not go the full length of the spinal column. The spinal cord starts at around the level of C1, and then it travels down to about the L1, L2 interspace. What's below the L1, L2 interspace is still neurological tissue. It's just not considered the spinal cord. It's considered the corda equina. These are nerve roots, okay? We have connective tissue such as the meninges. And I know that you all know what meningitis is, which is inflammation of the meninges. Sometimes it's bacterial, sometimes it's viral. And the meninges comes in three different flavors, right? We know that there's the pia mater, arachnoid, and dura mater. And then we have fluid. Um, that surrounds the spinal cord, and that fluid happens to circulate in the subarachnoid space, and that fluid is called CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. Re just to review, the CSF, or cerebral spinal fluid, is produced by one of the neuroglial cells. Do you remember which neuroglial cell? I'll give you a second. There are six of them, remember? The ependymal cells, very good, the ependymal cells. So let's take a look at another cross section of the spinal cord and we'll review some of the layers here. Okay, let's take a look. We have the spinal meninges, we have the pia mater, the arachnoid, and the dura mater. So from inside to out, it's pad, P, A, D. D is most external, the P is the most internal, the pia mater is closest to the spinal cord, the dura mater is closest to the vertebrae. Now we have a few spaces. We have a subarachnoid space. Remember that's where the cerebral spinal fluid flows. And then we have the subdural space. The subdural space, as we see here, is filled with interstitial fluid, not cerebral spinal fluid. 
the subarachnoid space is filled with CSF. Okay. And this is a really nice picture. The reason why I like it is it shows the spinal cord with the meninges, but also the vertebrae that protects it. All right, and this is why spinal alignment is so very important and why healthy discs are so important and a freely movable, unfixated spine is so important because it allows for the flexibility of the spinal cord to travel through there and the nerve roots to come through. So if we take a look, we see gray matter and we see white matter. Now remember the white matter is where the tracks are, sensory and motor tracks. Now we have nerve roots. We have a ventral and a dorsal. Now there's a trick to figuring out which is ventral and which is dorsal, and we have to look at the structure and go, are there any giveaways that tell us the difference? And there's actually two giveaways, actually probably three giveaways in this picture. So once you see a vertebra and we see a spinous process, well, we know that that is posterior. Or if we see the vertebral body, then we know the vertebral body is ventral or anterior. But if let's say the vertebra wasn't there, would you be able to identify the ventral root versus the dorsal root? And here's what would give it away. If here's a cross section again, and let's make that butterfly or the letter H in the middle. And there's no vertebra. We see this, and then we see this coming in and this coming out. You have to look for that bump. You have to look for that swelling. That swelling is a ganglia. What is the definition of a ganglia? Remember, a ganglia is a group of nerve cell bodies located outside of the CNS. So once we see this ganglia, the ganglia is called the DRG, which stands for dorsal, dorsal root ganglia. So the fact that it's a ganglia on the dorsal root, dorsal root ganglia tells us it has to be on the dorsal root. So there is that swollen portion right there. And we could see it here again, and it's even labeled dorsal root ganglia. Okay, so that's a little trick. The ventral root does not have any swollen ganglia on it. The dorsal root is carrying sensory information, and the ventral root is carrying motor information. Okay, now this is a very important picture. And a few things I want you to keep in mind here. So the spinal cord, we can see, starts at around the level of C1, but that's also where the medulla is. So the medulla is part of the brain. It's part of the brain stem. The brain stem is made up of a few parts. It's got the midbrain. It's got the pons. And then it has the medulla. The medulla is inferior, which is right here. Medulla is protected by the top two vertebrae, C1 and C2. Atlas is C1, just like the Greek god holds up the world. That's the atlas. And then C2 is considered to be the axis. Now, in the neck, we have two plexus. There's one called the cervical plexus, and there's one called the brachial plexus. Brachial plexus gets a lot of attention because these nerves, these five terminal branches right here, is what controls all of the muscles from the shoulder down to the fingers. So every muscle action from the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, and the fingers, what controls that is what's happening at the neck at levels C5 to T1. Now when I say C5 to T1, you have to know what nerve roots that means. That means it's C5, C6, C7, C8, and then T1. And remember, you may be saying, what? C8? How could that be? I thought there's only seven cervical vertebrae. There are seven cervical vertebrae, but look at the picture here. There are eight cervical 
nerve roots. All right, so C5 to T1 is the brachial plexus, but above it, C1 to C5 is the cervical plexus. And a very important nerve that comes off of that, of all of these, I'd probably pay a little bit more attention to the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve comes from C3, C4, and C5. C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. The phrenic nerve controls the diaphragm for breathing. So keep in mind, if there is a traumatic birth or excessive traction on a baby's neck during birth, it can actually traction those nerve roots between C3, C4, and C5, and now the baby's APGAR score may not be as high because the breathing isn't as efficient as it should be. So C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive, and then behind C1 and 2 is the medulla oblongata, where cranial nerve, cranial nerve 10 is located. And cranial nerve 10 is the vagal nerve. And the vagus nerve controls the heart, and it also controls the lungs. And if there's a subluxation between C1 and C2, now remember the baby's being pulled out during birth, but not just traction, there's extreme head rotation. So not only is there pulling, but the doctors have to take the head rotated all the way right or all the way left so that the shoulders spin and the shoulders are in alignment with the vaginal canal to come out. So if there's subluxation, if there's subluxation there, then there's going to be interference to the medulla, which controls heart and lungs. Okay, so... What else do I want you to know here? You need to be familiar with the brachial plexus and you need to be familiar with the names of those nerve roots, the musculocutaneous, axillary, median, radial, and the ulnar nerve. Okay, so um, we will go through these shortly in just a little bit, but I want at least to lay down some of that foundational work uh, right now. Okay. Okay. Um, in the lower back, there's the lumbar plexus. And the lumbar plexus, you could see, is L1, L2, L3, L4. L1, 2, 3, and 4 is the lumbar plexus. And then there's another one beneath it, L4 to S4. L4 to S4 is the sacral plexus. And the sacral plexus is where the infamous sciatic nerve comes from. Okay, this is when people experience sciatica, and there is the sciatic nerve. You can see it is the largest, thickest axon or nerve in the human body. Okay, and it's actually made up of two nerves combined. The sciatic nerve is made up of the common peroneal nerve, and it's also made up of the tibial nerve. Those two nerves make up the sciatic. Okay, uh, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve from the lumbar plexus is important. And when that one gets compressed, it kind of gives this condition that's called moralgia parasthetica. And moralgia parasthetica is almost like a reverse sciatica where the individual may experience numbness and tingling to the front and the lateral aspect of their thigh. And it's commonly seen in pregnant women as their belly gets bigger or someone who's getting a little bit obese, or someone that's wearing a tight belt, or someone wearing tight, tight jeans um, that's being compressed at the waist, or police officers who are wearing a belt with a nightstick and gun that's hanging off to the side that can also compress it, or construction workers and contractors who have the tool belt with all their tools hanging down. Oftentimes it will just compress that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve giving that individual numbness and tingling down the front lateral aspect of the thigh. Okay. All right, and we see here off to the right that the spinal cord ends at L1 and L2, but when a baby is born, it actually extends down to L4. Well, what happens in an adult that would make it end at L1 and L2? As that child grows and they get taller, the spinal cord pulls up as they grow taller. All right, but the growth of the cord stops at about age five. Notice, is there a plexus in the thoracic region? Nope, there is no plexus in the thoracic region. 
you only have intercostal nerves, which are nerves that go in between the ribs. And in between the ribs, there are muscles called intercostal muscles. There's internal and external intercostal muscles for inspiration and expiration. What's unique about those is uh, there's a very high incidence of herpes zoster going around today or shingles, higher than ever, and it's probably because of the chickenpox vaccine. The herpes zoster or the shingles is a residual of the chickenpox. Okay, it's a form. So it typically comes out when the person's under lots of stress. These viruses hang out in the dorsal root ganglias, and when their resistance becomes weak, it starts to come through and it spreads down through the ribs or it follows dermatomes. Okay, those, those are the two um, common findings with the intercostal nerves. Okay, the end of the spinal cord, here's some terminology that would be important to know. So right over here is the conus medullaris. If you follow that, you can see it looks like an ice cream cone right there. It comes to a tip. And that tip is at around the L1, L2 interspace. That's the end of the spinal cord. The phylum terminale is an extension of pia mater that stabilizes the cord. It comes all the way down here to the bottom. You can see it kind of anchors to the tip of the coccyx. The corda equina, equina means horse. So corda means caudal the opposite of cephalad, which means head. So down at the bottom, there's like a horse's tail and all of these filaments coming out in this direction are fanning like the tail of a horse. Okay. And a spinal segment is simply just an area of the cord from which each pair of spinal nerve arises. Now this is a really nice picture. It's a great cross section. So let's go through some of the cross sectional anatomy. Now go find the dorsal root ganglia. Right? You can see that swollen portion right here. Well, if that's the dorsal root ganglia, then what nerve root is this? It's got to be dorsal because it's the dorsal root. This is the spinal nerve. So spinal nerves, are they sensory or are they motor or are they considered mixed because they're both? They're mixed because they're both. They are both sensory from the dorsal root and then their motor because of the ventral roots, okay? Now they're also rootlets. These are roots, but right here you see these small little rootlets. So these are ventral rootlets, and then you can see them here on this side as well. These are ventral rootlets, and then dorsal rootlets are here at the other side. All right, let's take a look at what other anatomy we have here. Let's look at the gray matter, which is the butterfly in the middle. Here are the horns. So once you know there's a dorsal root, then this is the dorsal horn. And if there's a dorsal horn, then there has to be a ventral horn. The ventral horn is also known as the anterior gray horn. And then there's a lateral horn. Okay, now once we see a lateral horn, we know that it has to be either a thoracic vertebrae section or an upper lumbar because in the lateral horns are where the sympathetic neural system lies. And the sympathetics, remember, are called the thoracolumbar outflow because it goes from T1 to L2. So it's thoracolumbar outflow, that's sympathetic. Those are only found in the lateral gray horns. So it's got to be a segment between T1 and L2 and here it says it is a section of the lumbar spinal cord, so it has to be L1 or L2. Okay, right in the center is called the central canal. That's where CSF is flowing through. And everything on the, uh, let's go nerve roots again on the right-hand side. So there is a sensory neuron, which is the dorsal root. There is a motor neuron. You can see here axons of the motor neuron. And then what's relaying the sensory, what is relaying the sensory neuron to the motor neuron? That's going to be this one right here, which is an interneuron or 
an association neuron. Okay, let's go and look at the white matter. So in the white matter, we have columns. We have posterior columns. We have anterior columns. And then we have lateral columns. Okay, the columns are where the tracks are, sensory and motor tracks. Now I'm going to change the color here just to make it a little bit easy on you. Let's make this one blue. So if we go to the posterior columns, which is this and this, these are the posterior columns. You see it looks like some pieces of pie here, right? Here and here. Okay, so these two pieces of pie, this one that's more medial is called the fasciculus gracilis, and the one lateral to it is called the fasciculus cuneatus. Now this is where the posterior columns is where all your proprioception um, is detected. So the posterior columns do proprioceptive awareness, meaning knowing where your body is in space and time. It deals with vibrational sense, two-point discrimination, and discriminative touch being able to determine where you're being touched. It's just that fasciculus gracilis does those things for the lower extremity, whereas the fasciculus cuneatus does all those things for the upper extremity. Okay. All right. And another important structure is the PMS, the posterior median sulcus, and then the AMF, the anterior median fissure. So that's another uh, I'm just going to clear that out again, and so there's less writing here for you. But the AMF, if you look at that depression, and you look at the posterior median sulcus, that's another landmark that you can use to determine anterior from posterior, if there's any uh, questions on this on an exam, because you could see the posterior median fissure just looks a little bit wider, doesn't it? That gap. This one looks very, very thin. Okay, okay. Uh, we know that there are individuals that have to go for a lumbar tap sometimes, or they go for an epidural. Now, where do you think they would have to get that epidural? Or sampling of cerebral spinal fluid? Anywhere there is no spinal cord, because you don't want to inject a needle into the spine where there is spinal cord, because the person will become paralyzed. So they have to go below the spinal cord. So what levels does the spinal cord end? L1 and L2. So the technique of injecting this needle into the subarachnoid space to pull out CSF is safe anywhere from L3, L4, and L5. It's also a place of injecting antibiotics, anesthetics, or chemotherapy. And it's a great way of measuring cerebral spinal fluid pressure. This is a great uh, illustration just showing gray matter and white matter. In this picture, the letter H is gray, and what's on the outside that's stained very, very dark is the white matter. Now, can you see the AMF and the PMS, right? The AMF, the anterior median fissure, oops, let's go back, sorry about that. If you look at the anterior median fissure, that's right here. See how that gap is much thicker than the posterior median sulcus, which is here. And then you can see the horns and the columns. This happens to be a thoracic vertebra. How do we know? Because you don't only see a dorsal horn and a ventral horn, but we also see a lateral horn. And what's the lateral horn? sympathetic nerve system T1 to L2. So we know it can't be a cervical vertebra. They're telling us it's a thoracic spinal cord section. Okay, here's just another view. This is the lumbar region. And all the same structures are here. You can see, could you identify which is anterior and which is posterior? Can you identify the dorsal horn from the ventral horn? 
you could see the anterior median fissure very obviously, right? Look for that wider gap. It's this one right here. Much more obvious than the PMS, right? The posterior median sulcus. You can see the central canal. You can see the posterior gray horn, also known as the dorsal horn. You can see the anterior gray horn or the ventral horn. All motor information starts from here. There are anterior horn cells and it goes out to the motor neuron right to the skeletal muscle. Okay. All right, so those black circled regions are the columns in white matter. There's the dorsal column, ventral column, and lateral column. There is a typo here that I just picked up, so let me point it out to you, or a mistake, so I don't want you to get confused. This is a motor neuron, which means that this is a ventral root, and this is a sensory neuron, which is a dorsal root, right? Well, if this is the ventral root, then how can these be posterior rootlets? See the mistake? So this shouldn't say posterior rootlets, cross that out. What should that say? Ventral, ventral rootlets, okay? All right, in the posterior white columns contain axons that form ascending and descending tracks. How does information travel in the spinal cord? The white matter tracks conduct nerve impulses to and from the brain. And the gray matter receives and integrates the incoming and outgoing information to perform spinal reflexes. Now, when you look at this, everything on the right-hand side in blue, those are sensory tracks, and everything on the left in red are motor tracks. We know sensory tracks are ascending, which means they go from the spinal cord up to the brain. That's sensory. The motor tracks are called descending because they actually start in the brain and they go down. So just think of it as an elevator system, these tracks. It's either an up elevator or a down elevator. If it's an up elevator, it's carrying information to the brain. What type of information? Sensory information. If it's a down elevator, it's going from the brain down. That's descending or motor information. The names also give a clue as to whether they're sensory or motor. So if we look at the names and we see something called the spinocerebellar, it means it's going from the spine to the cerebellum. So if it's going from the spine to the brain, is it sensory or motor? Sensory. If we have one called the spinothalamic, it means it's going from the spine to the thalamus. The thalamus is in the brain. So that's another ascending or sensory tract. But if we have a tract that's called a corticospinal. It means it's going from the cortex of the brain down to the spine. That's a descending tract or motor. If it's going from the vestibulospinal, the vestibular apparatus to the spine, that means that this is also going down. It's a descending or motor tract. So is reticulospinal, tectospinal, corticospinal. If it's ending in the spine, it means it's starting in the brain. And then here's the posterior columns. Again, you've got the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus for proprioception, vibration, two-point discrimination, and discriminative touch. Let's look at uh, sensory and motor processing. The internal anatomy of the spinal cord allows sensory and motor information to be processed in an organized way. You could see these numbers. So you have information or sensory receptors in the skin. Number two, we have a sensory neuron. Number three, there's a sensory tract, an ascending tract that can go up to the brain. And then number four, where's our number four? It's still crossing over to the other side. So some information is gonna stay on the same side of the brain and other information is going to cross over, okay? And then you have an interneuron or association neuron that relays 
sensory information to the motor neuron. Okay, and then that motor neuron is going to send information out and it's going to descend all the way down to either the skeletal muscle or to the organs of the body. Okay, so tracks again, these are the highway of sensory and motor information. Sensory tracks ascend, that means they go up to the brain. Motor tracks descend, that means they go down. And the naming of the tracks are going to indicate the position and the direction of the signal. So if we're talking about the anterior spinal thalamic, it's going to tell us it's in the anterior part of the cord. Spinal thalamic, it goes from the spine to the thalamus, so we know it's a sensory tract. And here we can take a look at where they are. Let me circle a few of these. So if we're talking about the cortico spinal, cortico brain down to the spine. So this is telling us that this is going to be motor. So cortico spinal, there's a lateral cortico spinal, and then there's going to be an anterior cortico spinal. These are both motor. The lateral cortical spinal tracts, these you know very well, these crisscross. So these tracts may start at, let's say, the left side of the brain. They come down, and at the level of the medulla, they cross to control the right side of the body. Then there are cortical spinal tracts that start on the right side of the brain, come down crisscross at the level of the medulla, which is C1, C2, to control the left side of the body. And we know if someone's ever had a stroke on the right side of the brain, what side of the body becomes paralytic? The opposite side. So that's the lateral cortical spinal. The anterior cortical spinal controls the head, neck, and trunk. The, the lateral cortical spinal controls the extremities. Spinothalamic. Now in the spinothalamic, same thing. There's a lateral spinothalamic tract, and there's an anterior spinal thalamic. If you look at the name, spinal thalamus. So it's starting at the spine, going up to the thalamus. What's unique about the thalamus is I'll give you a little heads up before we get to the brain. The thalamus is the relay station for all sensory input. Every single sensory bit of information that your body takes in, with the exception of the sense of smell, ends up in the thalamus. So spinal thalamic is sensory. Lateral spinal thalamic is controlling pain and temperature. And the anterior spinal thalamic is crude and touch and deep pressure. So pain and temperature is the lateral spinal thalamic tract. And then crude touch and deep pressure is going to be the anterior spinal thalamic tract. And then what's the posterior columns? What's their function back here? Well, it's proprioception, two-point discrimination, vibration, and the fasciculus gracilis does it for the lower extremity. Fasciculus cuneatus does it for the upper extremity. Spino cerebellar, uh, by its name, spine to cerebellum, it's going to carry information into the cerebellum uh, that's going to maintain posture, balance, and equilibrium. So spinal thalamic, again, if it's the anterior, uh, if it's the, let me change the pen, let's get the pen on here. If it's the lateral spinal thalamic, it's pain and temperature. If it's the anterior spinal thalamic, it's deep pressure and crude touch. The posterior columns, which is the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus, we're talking about proprioceptive awareness, where your body is in space and time, discriminative touch, Hey, can you tell me whether I'm touching you on the right shoulder or left shoulder? Two-point discrimination is just as it sounds. I can take two fingers, one on the left scapula and my other right finger on your right scapula and say, how many places am I touching you? And you should be able to identify two. And then I can move both my fingers medially, maybe to the vertebral borders of the scapula and say, how many places am I touching you? You should still say two. But as they come closer to the spine, the messages get a little bit confusing. Most people will then say one as you get closer to midline to the spine. It also, posterior columns, posterior columns is pressure and vibration. Uh, the direct pathway are the cortical spinal tracts. That's the 
lateral corticospinal that controls the extremities. It's going to be voluntary movement, and it's going to control its precision. And the cortical bulbar is more involved with facial muscles. The indirect pathways, uh, these are muscle um, nerve tracts like the rubrospinal and vestibulospinal. These are going to control things like automatic movements, uh, posture, muscle tone, equilibrium, visual reflexes. These are all things that are kind of like subconscious. You're not thinking about them. If you slip on black ice and your body can balance itself out without falling, those are automatic movements. Coordination of visual reflexes. You may hear a noise to your right and then your head and eyes move in that direction. You don't have to think about it. They just happen with reflexes. Okay, spinal reflexes. <clears throat> Uh, spinal reflexes are automatic responses to changes in the environment. They are uh, the integration center for spinal reflexes is going to be the gray matter. And a typical example of this will be a somatic reflex that results in, a ske in skeletal muscle contraction. For example, when a doctor taps with a reflex hammer over your infrapatellar tendon, what happens when they tap that tendon? it creates a contraction of your quadricep muscles and your leg extends. That's a somatic reflex, an example of one. Uh, autonomic and visceral reflexes involve smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. Uh, these are things that automatically can increase or decrease heart rate, respiration, digestion, and urination. Now there are also cranial nerves, 12 pairs of cranial nerves that uh, we spoke about in one of the earlier lectures. There are cranial nerves that have reflexes, for example, shining a light into someone's eyes, and the pupil should constrict. When it moves away, they should dilate. So that involves cranial nerve two and three. It's called a pupillary light reflex. If I shine a bright light in someone's right eye, the right pupil should constrict. The sensory part of that is the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve two. And then the motor part is actually cranial nerve three. So it's two and three together. Um, I can put slight pressure on your eyeball with my finger, with your eyes closed, and your blood pressure will drop. That's cranial nerve five and 10. Okay, cranial nerve five is the trigeminal nerve. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagal nerve. I can put pressure around the carotid sinus on the side of the neck and your blood pressure will drop. That's cranial nerve nine and 10. Nine is sensory, it's the glossopharyngeal nerve. 10 is the vagal nerve, which is motor. Okay, just a few examples of some cranial reflexes. Okay, let's look at the components of a reflex arc. There's five components of it. There is a sensory component, which is, has a receptor, which is number one, a sensory receptor. It sends the information to a sensory neuron. Then it integrates that information at the association neuron. Then there's a motor neuron, and then it sends it out to an effector. There are four important somatic spinal reflexes. Let's take a look at them. One is the stretch reflex. Then there's the Golgi tendon reflex. Then there's the flexor withdrawal reflex, and then a crossed extensor reflex. Let's look at the stretch reflex. An example of that will be the patellar reflex. So um, this one can work one of two ways. A stretch reflex, an example is if the doctor took a reflex hammer and hit the infrapatellar tendon. The tendon is actually being stretched. And as a result of that stretch, the muscle spindles pick up that signal and it's gonna activate your quadriceps to contract. Whenever you overstretch something, muscles shorten as a defensive reflex so it doesn't tear. You know this is true because if you bend down to touch your toes and your hamstrings are tight and you force that, what ends up happening is your hamstrings tighten and your knee bends. Reciprocal inhibition or reciprocal innervation is this um, neurological phenomena of how your agonist and antagonist work together. So if you take a step 
and you go forward, your quadriceps may contract, whereas your hamstrings have to relax. So the muscles in the front and the muscles in the back, one have to be excited, while the other has to be inhibited or shut down. So in this classical example, you can see that the reflex hammer is tapping the infrapatellar tendon right here. And as a result, this structure right here is the receptor that's picking up that stretch. So the muscle spindle is the receptor. It picks up that stretch, is gonna send the sensory information through the sensory neuron, through the dorsal root ganglia, and then it's going to create the synapse somewhere in that dorsal root. And it's gonna relay the sensory information to the motor nerve root, which is the ventral nerve root. But you'll see that one of these lines is solid red and the other one is dotted. The reason being the solid red is the excitatory impulse and the dotted red is the inhibitory impulse. So the excitatory message is gonna to go to the quadriceps. The inhibitory message goes to the hamstrings. That's the law of reciprocal inhibition. The agonist, which are the quads, have to be excited, so there's the plus sign. Whereas in order for that to happen, the hamstrings, the antagonists, have to shut down. When the hamstrings relax and the quads contract, guess which direction the leg moves? Upward into extension. That's the stretch reflex. The Golgi tendon reflex is a little different. This one is not going to, when, when the sensory component is stimulated by tension, not by stretch, but by tension, the Golgi tendon, which is the receptor, is going to blow out the muscle to relax. So a classical example of this one is if you dare challenge me to an arm wrestle, okay? If you arm wrestle me and I say, ready, set, go, and all of a sudden you start really using all of your power and you start moving my arm and then I use my strength and I come forward and I look at your face and I see your face is turning red and your eyeballs look like they're gonna push out of your head because you're trying so hard I could see smoke coming out of your nose and your ears and you're trying to beat me in this arm wrestle. It's just not gonna happen. So what'll end up happening is your biceps and your anterior delts and your wrist flexors, they've been working so hard, but if you continue to apply tension and contraction against my strength, what can happen to your arm? It can break. You don't want to break your radius or your ulnar or rip your biceps tendon off of your arm. So your muscles just blows out and then I leave victorious. Okay, that's a classical example of a Golgi tendon organ reflex. In this picture, let's say uh, this person is sitting and they're at the gym and they're trying to do leg extensions. So there's resistance that's being pushed this way. And you're trying to lift your leg in this direction to do leg extensions. Well, there's tension in the quads. So the increased tension is going to be sensed by the Golgi tendon organ. Well, that sensory input goes into number two, the sensory neuron. It's going to relay to the dorsal root. Some information goes up to the brain. And then the motor information leaves the ventral horn and it's going to go out to the muscles. Again, it's going to go to the quads and the hamstrings. The only difference here is that the quads are going to be shut down, whereas the hamstrings are going to be activated for the law of reciprocal inhibition. Okay, and then there's your association neuron, interneurons right there in the, in the center. All right, everyone's aware of this. Everyone has experience this once in their life with the upper extremity and the lower extremity. The flexor reflex or the withdrawal reflex, if you touch something hot or sharp with your hand, what does it do? It pulls away very, very quickly. That's the flexor reflex. The same thing happens with the foot. So if you step on a sharp tack as you look down near the toe at number one, you can see that there's the sharp tack here. The sensory information is going 
up, up, up through, let's just focus on this middle slide. Forget about the one up here and forget about this one here. Let's just look at the middle illustration of the spinal cord. So the sensory neuron comes up, up, up through the dorsal root ganglion. It synapses in the dorsal horn. Then there's the association neuron. And then motor information comes out only, it only needs to go to the hamstrings. And the hamstrings contract super quick and it pulls it away. That's the flexor reflex or the withdrawal reflex. Now, same thing happens on the left-hand side of this illustration of the crossed extensor reflex. This on the left-hand side we've already seen. On the left-hand side, this is nothing other than the flexor reflex. You see the sharp tack. We see the sensory input coming up. We see that it's going into the dorsal horn. We see the synapse, and from the motor neuron, it goes to the hamstrings, and the hamstrings contract, flexing the leg. Okay, we've seen that, no big deal. But what's happening is the crossed extensor reflex is, well, what happens if your left foot is pulled away, I'm sorry, if your right foot is pulled away, how do you maintain your balance? Well, the other leg has to remain extended, right? If your right leg bends, your left one has to extend. And the information is going to cross over. Look at the middle. You can see that it's crossing over excitatory to the quads, and the quads extend the leg. So one leg extends, the other leg flexes. Okay. Clinical considerations in terms of reflexes. You can check a client or a patient's reflexes that can help detect certain disorders. Um, we do this all the time in the office uh, because we can assess C5, nerve roots in the neck, C6, and C7. These all have reflexes. The C5 reflex, I'm just going to put a B for the biceps reflex, biceps reflex. C6 reflex is called the brachioradialis reflex. And the C7 reflex is the triceps reflex. So the doctor takes a reflex hammer and taps the biceps tendon and you get elbow flexion, then your C5 nerve root is healthy. If there's non-responsiveness and there's been some sort of neck trauma, then we know that something's going on with C5. If you tap the brachioradialis muscle, but you tap it right over the, uh, the muscular tendinous junction and there's no reflex, then the problem's at C6. If you tap over the tendon of the triceps and there's no contraction, then the problem is at C7. If you tap over the infrapatellar tendon and there's no reflex, the problem is L4. And if you tap over the Achilles tendon and there's no problem and, the, and there is a problem, then the, pro then the nerve root that's being affected or interfered with is the first sacral segment, S1. So we can use this to determine if there's any type of lesion at different levels of the spinal cord. Reflexes are extremely important. There's another reflex that we can check that's called Babinski's sign. And this is done when you take a a blunt object and you start on the heel of the foot, the plantar surface of the foot, you come up to the outer part of the sole, like where the pinky toe is, and then you make the number seven, you come straight over to the great toe. So you're coming up from the bottom of the calcaneus on the plantar surface of the foot, going towards the pinky side, and then make a sharp turn, make the number seven, going to the great toe. When you do that, you're looking for a type of response. The normal response is curling under the toes. That's normal. An abnormal response or a response of children under 18 months of age is called Babinski sign. That is when the toes curl down, but the great toe extends up. That's called Babinski sign. It's only normal in children under 18 months of age. If it comes out on a child beyond 18 months, then there's something called an upper motor neuron lesion where there's something going on up in the brain, okay?
So it's normal in infants, but it can indicate damage in the CNS. So there is a normal response on the left-hand side. See the toes curl under, that's the plantar reflex where they curl down. But if you see the toes curling in B, but the great toe extending, that's a classical Babinski sign, upper motor nerve root lesions. Okay, in terms of nerve roots, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. There are eight in the cervical region, 12 in the thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one pair of coccygeal nerves. You know what, I think I'm going to pause here and I'm gonna make a second video just on these plexus. So let me pause this here.